Well, I'm very happy to be here in, uh, in, in Chag Sameach. Um, uh, this is a, quite an odd experience. And it, it's kind of, a, I just want to do a bookend a little bit about the um, experience for me of doing a tikkun on, um, on the Brady Bunch, which is how I understand uh, the Zoom, right? You know, I, I don't exactly, I didn't watch the Brady Bunch enough to know the names of the kids, but that's what it looks like every day now, you know? Um, and in some ways, uh, Zoom is the most mundane experience of all. Um, because that's what I do, like all the time. I just do Zoom uh, conferences, which is miraculous. But also, uh, uh, it, it becomes the norm after a number of weeks. So, so I, I, I want to try and do something um, uh, that will break that up because I think that's really the topic of Rosenzweig and Revelation. I'm, I'm really happy to be introduced by uh, Abby True and my friend from Minyan Ma'at um, gave great talks and, uh, and, and I loved it. And, I, and I, it, I, I can't say I miss that much about America, but I do miss Binyan Ma'at and all the people there. So, uh, so that, that really um, uh, touches me to do this. Of course, um, it's eight o'clock in the morning here over beautiful Budapest. Um, I live right above the river. So, so this is the most awake I've ever been um, at a Tikkun where they always put me to teach at one or two in the morning. So. Um, so I'm commiserating with you how late it is, but for me, it's, it's a regular morning time and I'm having my morning coffee. I've already um, uh, had cheesecake. All right, uh, the last thing that Abby said about my bio, if the long bio, um, uh, um, which always seems to me at the end, I say to myself, sounds like I can't keep a job, but I did, I did. I worked for 20 years or more at UJA. Um, but my, the, the last thing you said, or nearly last, is that I went to Brandeis. And, and, and that really is the beginning of this little tale for me. Um, uh, when I was around 18 years old, um, I was part of a community called the Chavrat Shalom. Um, the Chavrat Shalom was this fantastic uh, group of uh, young Jews um, living in Somerville, Zalman Schachter and Art Green and Barry Holtz and Michael Strassfeld and um, Eddie Feld and Danny Matt and, um, and all these people, these were my day-to-day uh, -day friends. Um, and we um, davened together and we particularly learned together. And the kind of learning that we did at the Chavura was very intense. It was kind of like life-shaping um, in a way that no learning I had done in my teenage years. Um, oh, also, I loved, I, I loved the Chavura and particularly in the early years. So, you know, we, we would study things um, that were, just, you know, would catch you on fire. You like couldn't sleep at night. It was, you know, after, after going to high school, it was like totally different experience. Um, and I, and I, I identified that at the very beginning. Um, I studied with uh, my teacher, Everett Gendler, um, and all these other people I just mentioned. And we studied together um, um, the text called Shir Shirim Rabbah, the, the Midrash on the Song of Songs. Um, and it was all of a sudden about love and, and um, confrontation and engagement and, and, and then more love and eroticism. I mean, it was nothing that a 17-year-old should have been allowed to listen to. Um, and, and it was Jewish at the same time. So it was my property. It was like, whew, I couldn't, I could barely get over that. Um, and that was in the, um, in the fall of 1969. Um, and, and the spring of 1970. And at the end of that, I, I decided to go to Brandeis University as, to be an undergraduate. Um, and I went to Brandeis. This was before, my, before I actually um, uh, was a student because they were having an all-night study there. And I'd never heard of an all-night study. I mean, what, would it, what did it mean, an all-night study? And I, I expected this, the same kind of study at the Chavra. And I remember um, walking into some building, I can't remember the building at uh, Brandeis, and there was a little guy, um, gray haired, you know, older gentleman with a deep German accent. accent. His name was Nachum Glatzer, um, and he was the first um, teacher of the night. So a, a word about him, because it's really my introduction to the Tikkun, an all night study. Nachum Glatzer was um, a refugee from Germany, and he was the secretary of Rosenzweig. Um, so he gave us this story about Franz Rosenzweig, which was 
an uh, overwhelming uh, story, and I'll, 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 I'll tell you the story in uh, just a, a moment. Um, and, and Glasser told it in a particular way. Uh, in, the, in the intervening years, um, people have doubted his story. Maybe Rosenzweig told it wrong. Maybe Glasser told it wrong. Maybe Rosenzweig's mother told it wrong. Rosenzweig's mother being the one that told the story more than anybody. Um, uh, um, and, uh, but I'm, I'm going to tell the story the way Glasser said. Glasser was really the person, Rosenzweig, um, I'll tell you his, his biography in just a moment. Um, but he was an, an, an incredible figure in the, in the early part of the 19th century, of the uh, early part of the 20th century, um, and really a pivotal figure. And one, one of the things that he did in his life was he engaged adults and community of peoples um, to study Jewish texts together, not simply for the study of the Jewish text, but in order to encounter each other and to engage each other, and in some ways do therapy for Judaism. That's really what his, his view was. He was going to, ther to build a structure of therapy for not the Jews, but Judaism itself. Um, and when he designed and, and was the first director of the Yiddish Freier Lehrhaus, the Jewish Free um, uh, Study Center Lehrhaus in Frankfurt, uh, Germany, that, that's basically what he did. And Glasser, his student, was one of the first attendees of that. So I just want to draw this kind of uh, line between the, the, the Lehrhouse of Frankfurt, um, the first tikkun that I went to at Brandeis University, and my first online tikkun in my life right this minute. So that's the, that's the program. Sound, sound okay? Shake your head, yes? Hello, you out there? Yeah? Good, okay. Uh, Rosenzweig uh, was born in 1886 in Frankfurt. He was um, uh, uh, upper middle class, maybe even more than that. His father owned a department store in the city of Frankfurt of Castles, which was just outside of Frankfurt. He lived on a leafy street. Um, he lived a bourgeoisie um, uh, existence of no particular distinction. He was one of the assimilated Jews of uh, late 19th century Germany. Um, assimilated Jews in, in the late 19th century doesn't mean what it means today. I think when we say he's an assimilated Jew, um, means that he's hardly a Jew anymore at all. This was not true about Rosenzweig. He was plenty Jewish. He only knew other Jews. He lived in a Jewish neighborhood. He, he thought about being a Jew, um, and all of his friends were, were Jews. So he was, what assimilated Jew meant in the end of the 19th century was we will be Jews that look like Germans. Um, he even said, if you put half of me together, my Deutschdom, um, uh, my German side, and my Jewish side, know that my heart would be on the German side. But if they tried to cut me in half, I wouldn't survive the operation. Right? It's kind of a nice image, right? German and Jewish on both sides, and the Jewish side um, uh, was less important, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't, um, he couldn't lose that part. It was essential to um, who he was growing up. Um, uh, the 19th century, end of the 19th century, um, in Germany was, a, was a, a, an odd time. Um, and it was odd primarily because of the philosophy of the 19th century. So I know this is two o'clock in the morning for you, and I'm going to mention the name Hegel. It's not often that you think about Hegel at two o'clock in the morning. Usually thinking about Kant, you know, or maybe, maybe Levinas, but Hegel, you know, but all right, here comes Hegel. Um, uh, Hegel was the dominant figure of the 19th century, although probably not what he thought, right? It was basically, um, I'm getting all these nice things that Lorraine studied with Nachman Glasser at Boston University, um, uh, who's a wonderful teacher, really had an enormous impact on me and everybody else. He, he brought his, his uh, German um, Jewish sensibility right to us. And, 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 and he also confronted Hegel. So here's what Hegel said. Hegel was going to be the, the philosophy of the end of history. You know, he was going to say that everyone is now going to, you know, a, approach what we'll, what we'll call in some way or another um, the new civil society, right? It was going to be the rational world. We were all going to live in a rational world now. Um, this would all culminate in the bureaucratic state in the Protestant civil religion, in the capitalist economy. Um, and, uh, and everyone would now be 
um, uh, part of the overall part of uh, the, the overall state. In fact, it was so powerful that Rosen Zweig himself wrote his PhD dissertation on Hegel in the state. And, this, and everyone would, would be religious because religion would be used not as a spiritual path, but as a social path. So the social path would be, you would be a good Hegelian German citizen, you would study religion, and the religion would tell you how to be a regular mundane person, right? Ordered, go to work, come home, relax on the weekend, go to work, that's it not a life of um, a, 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 a particularly tightly defined life. And this was the idea of German idealism. This was the only way that the world could progress um, into the next stage of human existence. Here's Rosenzweig. He, in some way or another, um, uh, buys into this. And he um, uh, grows up thinking he's going to be a physician and goes to the university and studies with Frederick Meinecke, which in 1912, um, he starts to uh, uh, meet with his cousins and they say, this is a terrible existence. And if you're gonna do a better existence, then you have to um, be religious in the spiritual sense, the 20th century religious way, not the 19th century philosophical way, the 20th century religious way. And you have to really confront the, the amazing aspects of of true existence, of true life. And so what he does, what Rosenzweig does, is he says, I'm going to become a, a Christian because Christianity is a religion and Judaism is just mundane. It's kind of like suburban leafy Judaism, very much the kind of Judaism that I grew up in, in South Brookline when I was growing up. Lovely, leafy existence, not too interesting. Anything interesting in Judaism was pushed away right away because it was too exotic. All right. Rosenzweig um, decides to study Judaism for the year of 1912 and 1913. And then Yom Kippur of 1913, this is the way Glotzer tells the story. From this, I'm, I'm going to tell the story. He goes to his mother and he says, you know, I'm going to become a Christian right after Yom Kippur. And Rosenzweig's mother says, um, I, I suspected that you were because you've been carrying around the New Testament a lot. Um, and uh, um, and uh, you're welcome to go to Yom Kippur, but not in our shul. It's an embarrassment. We don't want anybody who's going to become converted to some crazy understanding of Christianity coming to Yom Kippur. So please go to another shul. Rosenzweig says, okay, I'm going to go to another shul. And he goes that night to Berlin. And in Berlin, he goes to Prenzlauer Berger. And he, I've, I've done the Rosenzweig Germany tour. I've gone to his house. I've gone to his Dallaire house. I've seen all the buildings. Very impressive to me. He goes to the Riechstrasse synagogue, according to Glaser. Um, he goes into the synagogue. He's exactly on time for Kol Nidre because, you know, yeah, is, they're exactly on time. Um, he is going to go in. What do they say to him? Where's your ticket? He said, no, no, I don't have a ticket. This, I'm going for a religious experience. They said, we don't care if you're religious or not. If you don't have a ticket, there are no seats and you can't come in. All right, disaster. He says, where should I go? This is my last minute of being a Jew before I become a Christian. This does not convince the people to let him in. So... They say, you know, in this uh, square, in Prenzlauer Berger, there are Stieblach. There are little synagogues, you know, little shuls that the Hasidim from Poland who are trapped in Berlin go to. And, and they'll let anybody in. So why don't you go to one of those? So Rosenzweig says, uh, all right, I'll, I'll go to one of those because after all, I'm becoming a Christian tomorrow. I mean, he's really all set for it. Um, and this is his last moment. He's going to kind of atone for his Jewish life and then become a realized uh, person as a Christian. He goes to the shul and he walks into something that he's completely surprised by, right? And what he's surprised by is people wearing white coats and really davening, right? Pleading for their soul. They're almost, they're pleading to, for, for life. They're going, they're, it, he walks in out of the, out of, uh, the Berlin uh, um, environment into a society of people who are in a life and death situation. And he says, wait a second, this is what I'm looking for. And I'm, it doesn't matter if I become a Christian or I remain a Jew. The most important thing is I stop living in the Hegelian society. The most important thing is I discover wonder in my life. The most important thing is I encounter real, tangible emotions. The most important thing is I 
once again engage myself in the, in the therapy that I need as a bourgeois, um, flat uh, German citizen, and I once again become a, um, an, an engaged um, and deeply um, emotionally committed Jew. So in 1913, he walks out of that and he says, I'm not going to become a uh, Christian. I've decided to uh, remain a Jew. Not because Christianity, nothing against Christianity, but because of what he understands, there's no need to become a Christian. Judaism and Christianity both have this element of the critique of the world that, that he's from. So that's the, so Rosenzweig then um, goes into the, um, uh, soon after into the army. This is 1913, this is Weimar, Germany. Weimar, Germany is a kind of a, a, a blip in, uh, in German history of tremendous um, uh, um, uh, kind of liberty and, uh, and the liberal society and a very uh, kind of um, uh, edgy time. So if you think about uh, cabaret, you know, that's what you would think about um, as Weimar, Germany. Um, uh, Walter Rathenau um, is assassinated during this time. It has a very um, a visionary moment but it, it's ephemeral, right? The National Socialists are gonna come in in the early 30s and, um, and, and that'll be it. But in 1913, 1914, 1915, just before the war and during the war and just after the war, it is the, um, it is the society that um, everyone is kind of uh, boiling around and Rosenzweig is a piece of that society. It is, it's exotic, right? It's expressionist art and it's, uh, and it's, um, it's all this kind of um, new kinds of poetry and uh, different things that, that are gonna make up the Weimar Republic. And Rosenzweig is part of that as he's trying to find wonder in his life, right? And he also, um, oh, I see that Bria Paley has joined my daughter. It's always comforting when one of your kids still wants to listen to you this late. Um, uh, so, uh, um, uh, what, what happens with Rosenzweig in, in, in this time is he goes off to uh, war, he's a soldier in Montenegro, and he begins to write a book called The Star of Redemption. Um, and, and it's that book that, that it's a very complicated and incomprehensible almost book, but I'm going to try and comprehend it at two o'clock in the morning with all of you. So not, not for the faint of heart. Um, he does write a much easier book. If you want to read a book by Rosenzweig, which I, I highly suggest that you do, don't read The Star of Redemption. It's filled with crazy stuff and very hard. Um, read his much uh, better book, which is called um, Understanding um, Sickness and, and the Healthy. Because he says, look at, we live in a society um, which um, philosophy, particularly Hegel's philosophy, has made us all sick. And the reason that we're sick is that we have lost any sense of grip on the depth and um, wonder of life, right? This is a, he, he says, we, we, we've reduced everything to becoming just little pieces of the overall society and we've, we've lost our, our true selves. And what we need to do is we need to recover all of that um, sense of, of um, existence, of rich and deep existence. Good, everybody with me? Yeah? All right, let's put up the first slide, the picture of Rosenzweig. Any questions or comments? Let me see, I have to go into my chat for a second. Oh, I'm all working these on chats. getting up the uh, PowerPoint. Give me a minute. I, I did not know how to make a PowerPoint. That's all right, I figured it out. All right, now you wanted I the did, picture first. Yes? The bit, yeah. I did, I did learn how to uh, turn pictures right side up. So for me, that was my Thank you. That was hugely helpful for me. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. I, Hold I, on. I'm I really going to play it from that. the start, but I'm going to have to scroll through a little bit. Ah. Or no. right, we'll go to that next. No, no, this no, is no. Rose's flag, oh. although it's a very close up. There he is. We like this one better. <laughs> yeah, he was, a, he was a handsome guy. He was a um, uh, kind of a bon vivant. Of people, uh, uh, many people say that he was, you know, a socially very engaged person. Um, and he was. Uh, um, you know, kind of a leading man style person. Uh, many people also say that he, he was the person in, 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 um, uh, in search of ecstatic experiences, exactly right, um, which was quite relevant to me in 1970 when I 
started to learn about him. Um, uh, what happened to him uh, tragically, I think tragically for us all, was um, a good thing and a bad thing with the end of the story that I'm telling. Um, he comes back from the war um, and he starts the Lair House, which is basically the great grandfather, or maybe the grandfather of this tikkun at the JCC, right? When I grew up, JCCs didn't have a tikkun and they didn't have any Jewish learning. I mean, I, the, the, the JCC in, uh, in Brookline where I grew up didn't have a mezuzah on the door because it was too Jewish. So you just have to think about how far we've traveled in, in this lifetime. And I, and I credit Rosenzweig for that. I really do. I think that Rosenzweig is a, a major force in that. He, he has many um, uh, embarrassing uh, views now. He hated Islam. He, he was not particularly um, um, uh, good on issues around women. He was an anti-Zionist, maybe, or at least a non-Zionist. He was a globalist as a Jew. But his, his commitment to Jewish learning really was, um, uh, did, was the match that's, that lit this flame of, of Jewish learning. And so I, I won't apologize for all the other things, but I, I, I want to say that he comes back from the war and he, and he organizes this um, study session, this study um, uh, academy, this study place, for regular life. He says, you come in here and you do regular life. The people that are going to teach Judaism aren't going to be rabbis. They're going to be just people that, that have regular lives. And so we put a faculty together of Martin Buber and Gershom Sholem and Eric Fromm and Eric Hofstadter and, and um, uh, Trudweiss Rosemary and Nachum Glatzer and, and Abraham Joshua Heschel and, and on and on. So we put together like the all-star dream team faculty of all of Jewish life. Um, uh, and um, at some time, at some point, 30,000 people um, a month were going to the Lair House, which is a, a staggering amount of participation. He also contracted um, amniotropic lateral sclerosis of the vulva, um, which we sometimes call ALS, or more properly, Lou Gehrig's disease. I have to admit and say that uh, Lou, Gehrig's turn, Lou Gehrig turns out not to have had that disease. Um, Rosenzweig did, so I think we should now call it Franz Rosenzweig disease, but it's not catching on. Um, uh, and he became paralyzed. Um, and so for the last seven years of his life, um, he was um, in a, uh, a, a rocking bed um, and he could only point with his finger and his eyebrow um, to write um, all of these amazing things that he wrote. So the, the, the triumphant story of Rosenzweig is basically this story in which he, um, uh, in which he um, is going to become a Christian. He, he remains a Jew and, and, and he goes to war, he gets sick and he opens up the greatest Jewish learning place that, that maybe the modern Jewish world has known. Um, one more important thing as the introduction to others, like then I'll go into a text. Um, um, you know, his, his conversion experience back to Judaism, you know, so his re, re-engagement um, experience, it's not unusual in the world. Um, uh, when I was a uh, late teenager, I became uh, very inflamed with being Jewish, and I therefore, of course, became firm, right? I started going to um, black hat yeshivas, and, I, and I, it was just, that was the normal thing that you did. If you became what was called a Balchuva, you became a Balchuva. You became a, a, a much more traditional Jew. And, and in some ways, the picture of Karl Barth, um, the Protestant minister who says, I'm going to become more like St. Paul, as I reconvert to Christianity, is the norm. Rodesfeit didn't say this. He said, we should, now that I'm re-engaged in Jewish life, we should move forward, not backwards. We should image a new kind of Judaism. We should go and see ourselves in a new Jewish way, not return to what was, but actually create the next um, era of Jewish life. This is, and, and I'm gonna, he said, I'm gonna participate in this. This was an extraordinary, um, uh, thing to do. Um, all right, I'm now I'm going to go to the first text. There you go. So this is the um, this is the beginning of the new translation by Barbara Galili of the of the Star of Redemption. Um, uh, here's Rosenzweig. Rosenzweig says, "Any but any questions? Can I ask? Should do I ask for questions, comments? Unmute mute yourself. Just say anything you want." Nothing. You know, that's the good thing about mute, about, about Zoom. No one ever says like anything. 
Who knows? Are there still people there? Let me see. Michael, can you hear yeah. me? I just yeah. want to Jeff. say it's good to see you. It's good to see you, Jeff Fag. That's it? That's the question? That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> Love Jeff Fag. Thank you for inviting me. And thank Jeff Fag invited me to do this. I never would have thought to do it. All right, onward, onward to the text now. Um, uh, but uh, just to talk about Jeff Fag for one second. So, so Jeff Fag um, uh, was um, riding his bicycle or something like that in uh, Pound Ridge. Pound Ridge, is that it? What's it called? Yeah, uh, Croton on the Hudson. Croton on the Hudson. And he, and he goes into some kind of heart attack and Cardi he almost died. What? Cardiac arrest and technically cardiac I will arrest. Die. Yes, that's that's how I understand heart attack. Cardiac arrest, and and he almost died. I died. Technically died. Oh, he dies. He dies. This is extremely relevant for the next uh, uh, um, opening of Rose's fund. And you come out of that. I remember visiting you in the hospital, and you say, you know, this is this was an amazing experience, right? This was like if you don't die, and you can come back from that, it it expands everything. And I remember you in the hospital with with Michelle. And there was an aura around you of love. That's, that's, how I, that's how I experience you. I walk into that hospital room, I see Jeff Fag, and I say, my God, this is, this is not as thin a Jeff Fag as, uh, as we see on the screen right now, but, but right is a, a person who has an aura of, of new energy and new experience and new understanding of, of love, right? Rosenzweig, and I'm thinking, I come out of that and then, I need a ride uptown, so we, so we have a ride uptown, you know. And he's just coming out of the hospital. He's almost died, or he had died. Um, and I am thinking to myself, I'm in the car with Rosenzweig. Why is that? So now I'm going to read you the beginning of Rosenzweig. It says, introduction on the possibility of knowing the all, right? Not the sum, not a bit, the all. All right, here it goes. Uh, from death, it is from the fear of, um, um, from death, it is from the fear of death that all cognition of the all begins. Philosophy has the audacity to cast off the fear of the earthly, to remove from death its poisonous thing, from Hades its president, his pestilential breath. All that is mortal lives in this fear of death. Every new birth multiplies fear for, the, for a new reason, for it multiplies that which is mortal. The womb of the inexhaustible earth ceaselessly gives birth to what is new, and each one is subject to death. Each newly born waits for, with fear and trembling for the day of its passage into the dark. This is a very uplifting beginning of a book. Everybody reads the first paragraph of a book. I think they put it right back on the, on, on the shelf. They wouldn't read it at all. I mean, What's this book about, you know? I'm gonna try and scare you back into death. But look at, here's Rosenzweig, here's what he says. Rosenzweig says, if you take away the fear of death, he accused Hegel, whether rightly or wrongly, he accuses Hegel of taking away the fear of death. He says, you're now gonna become a wealth manager or a global finance guy in some big bank, I don't know, Merrill or, Morgan Stanley or something like that, and you are going to be a regular person, and you are going to have your wife and your kids, and they're all going to be regular and normal, and, and we're going to say, no fear of death. But if you don't have the fear of death, what does Rosenzweig also say? No fear of love. No, no love. No love. Because I'm going to put you in this narrow band of existence. That's how, what he accuses Hegel of. No fear of death. No love. In other words, I'm going to take the passion out of love, out of life. No more passion, right? Now you think about the word passion, even in English. Passion, we all know, passion of Jesus on the cross, right? The passion of uh, Matthew. This is about death. This is Jesus on the cross. This restores death. But he says, if you look at Jesus on the cross, this is why he doesn't become a Christian. What you, what you see is someone that doesn't actually die. He comes back to life. Love triumphs over death in Christianity. He says, no. All right, go to the, I think the next slide. Maybe not. I'm, I'll get to the, I'll get to, the, go to the more yellowed slide. That one. Let's see. 
I can't see the whole page. Yeah, let me play with it. But I, it is it is the red page. Can you read it if it's this small? That's the question. <laughs> I, I can read it if it's this small. Also, I, I have it next to me. So I am going to read it. If anybody else can read it, 203, I have the book. Here it goes. Um, I underline the word for you. These are the words of the love, which is as strong as death. There is a phrase in the Song of Songs, right? Beautiful phrase in the Song of Songs that goes, Azat kemavet ahava, be like a seal upon my heart, because love is as strong as death. Azat kemavet ahava. But it doesn't say love is stronger than death. If you say that love is stronger than death, according to Rosenzweig, what happens is that you, you blot out death, and therefore, the love that you have in life is impassionate. It's, it, 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 has, it loses its depth. That's what I experienced from Jeff that day, right? I, I experienced real depth, which was the death that he had experienced, and real love, which he had discovered because his whole sensory life, being emotional infrastructure, was now expanded. These are the words of the love, which is as strong as death. Not for nothing did we designate the transition from creation to revelation with them above. We have recognized the Song of Songs as the focal book of revelation. This is an amazing sentence, right? We have recognized the Song of Songs as the focal book of revelation. What does that mean? Rebbe Akiva, remember Rebbe Akiva, the great um, uh, uh, rabbi from the Talmud, he says that not only is the Song of Songs, which is an erotic love poem, what, one of the three Megillot, one of the three scrolls that we read by women, um, right? We read the book of Esther on Purim, we read the book of Ruth on Shavuot, and we read the Song of Songs on Passover. And the Song of Songs is mostly in a, women's, a woman's voice. And she is talking about kol do do fake, hark my, my lover knock, I, I'm looking for my lover, I'm, I, I find my lover, I lose my lover, I regain my lover. Rosa Feig says this, Rebbe Kiva says, this is the holy of holies of all the books of the Bible. And more than just the holy of holies of it, he says, this is actually the revelation. When we heard, when, when we were getting the Torah on Mount Sinai right now in a few hours, right? It's coming in a few hours. Right now it's nearly uh, 25 of three in the morning. You crazies being up still. For me, 8.35, um, uh, plenty of traffic outside, people going to work um, in downtown Budapest. He says, you stood at Mount Sinai, and it wasn't the Torah that we received. It was the Song of Songs. It was this love poem. It was this love poem between God and the, Jew, and, and the people of Israel during that moment. That was the real revelation. Think if we didn't have the Torah, but we only had the Song of Songs. No kashrut, no keeping strict Shabbat, no all of the law. We would only have love. That would be the relationship. That would be the revelation. When I talk about, about Rosenzweig's understanding, his notion of revelation, that's what it is. Song of songs, right? It's wholly personal. I, I, I've uh, underlined it. Uh, again, everything else in, I can't read this, but I do have the book in front of me, so now I'm going to read from my own book. Everything else can be spoken by love itself, not stated about it. For love is speech, active, wholly active, wholly personal, wholly living holy speaking. All true statements about love must be words from its own mouth, born by the I, by me itself. The only exception is this one sentence, that is that it is as strong as death, right? In Song of Songs. The living soul, I've underlined this, the living soul, loved by God, triumph over all that is mortal, and that is all that can be objectively stated about it. For nothing can be stated about the soul itself, only about its relationship with the world of creation. Only the soul can speak, for its, can speak about itself. The world of created things, the ground lies beneath her, not submerged, but surmounted. She soars above it. Your soul, your soul is not about, about being understood. Hegel and all the philosophers of that time said, we are going to build a philosophy about to describe soul. And Rosenzweig says, Shut up about scribe. I'm reading the book I'm reading from is The Star of Redemption by Franz Rosenzweig. And I'm on page 202 Revelation and the Ever Renewed Birth of the Soul. Rosenzweig says, Stop talking about the soul and touch your soul. Right? 
Stop talking about the creation and, and be part of the creation. Stop talking about God as, a, uh, as, as an entity and start to love God or experience God or be afraid of God. All of those things will, will be therapy and catapult you back into life. Okay, I need the star now. Star, yeah. Oh, no. I've been living in my apartment for now three months without any printers or anything else. Uh, down. No. I sent you a star. Yeah, hold on. The chart, it looks like this. The second slide, the second slide. Am I, am I unmuted? Number two, number oh, can two. Can you hear me? No, it's not the second one. Uh, it's, I, I know exactly what slide you're talking about. Hold on. Vamp for, vamp for one moment. I have to get it from another All place. Right. <laughs> I'm going to hold it up for you. Yeah, good. This is my handwritten star of redemption. All right, here's, here's what it means. It says, the basic story of Jewish life, all of Jewish life goes like this. Creation, revelation, redemption. We are created both as a world and as a people. We get the revelation on Mount Sinai. Where do we get the revelation? Weirdly, in the desert. Where would you expect it to come from? Um, uh, <laughs> Um, that's, I'm laughing at my daughter's little uh, posting. Um, uh, 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 you would expect to get the revelation on, in Jerusalem, on the, on, the, um, on the mountain, right? On the, on the top of the Temple Mount. But no, where do we get the revelation? At Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai is outside the land of Israel, right? Judaism for Rosa's flag was outside the land of Israel. Um, uh, uh, the Jewish people, as, long, as far as they were Jews, not Israelis, but Jews, are waiting to go to Israel. But the revelation comes on Mount Sinai before you get to Israel. So the foundational story of Judaism is we're created as a people in Egypt. We get, thank you so much, you're the best. We get, we get the revelation in, in, um, in, you're the best, Abby. Um, uh, we get the revelation, we get created in Egypt, we get the revelation in in, on Mount Sinai, and redemption is, is going home to Israel. He understands this as everywhere. On Friday night, we say the Kiddush, right, which is a little clip from the story of creation. So Friday night is creation. Shabbat morning, we read the Torah. That's revelation. And Shabbat, and, and just at Havdalah, we sing Eli Ohanavi about the Messianic time. This is redemption. And he says, and, and, and the holidays also, Passover creation, Shavuot right now is revelation, and Sukkot redemption. The story is so amazing though. He says, look at, I'm not gonna tell you what God is, and I'm not gonna tell you what the world is, objects, and I'm not gonna tell you what humanity is. Those are all philosophies terms. I'm, a, I'm now going to do religion. Nothing is about itself. Everything is in relationship. That's why it's so weird to be here in my, in my living room in Budapest speaking to all of you on a screen, but not connecting to any, uh, any of you really, except I can see Abby, which makes me feel happy. Um, uh, so so the, first, the first moment is creation. Creation is a relationship between God and the world, God the creator and the world the created. That's a relationship. Without creating, God isn't God and the world isn't the world. And that relationship is based on law, the laws of physics, the natural law, you know, all of those things. I, I think, uh, to Charles, the answer to the question is that Rosenzweig had a bigger impact on Buber than Buber on Rosenzweig. Um, uh, that Rivka Horowitz, in her book called Buber's Way to I and Thou, talks about a number of influences, and, and she, and, and Rosenzweig is already using the terms I and Thou in the Star of Redemption. Um, they were very close friends. Um, they wrote a book together. They, they translated the Bible together. Um, they engaged all the time. Um, and they, uh, they it was really Buber and Rosenzweig are, the, are, are together. So it's hard to know, know who the influence was. It may have been that the real influence was a guy named Franz Ebner, um, who wrote about a thing called the I solitude, um, that a person doesn't exist in and of themselves, that they have to be engaged. And as you can hear, there's a lot of Heschel in this as well. Heschel is really the student of Buber and Rosenzweig in that way. Yeah, I, I, I can't see the whole question of Mordecai Kaplan, but 
But Mordechai Kaplan is also in there, but he, I don't know, Mordechai Kaplan, he's, uh, he does not have the emotional thing. Uh, he gets Pesach as creation because it's the creation of the people, right? Um, he says creation comes in this moment of, of, I'll do this again in a minute, I hope. Um, he comes in a moment of, uh, of Mitzrayim, which are the narrows. Um, and he thinks of Mitzrayim, the narrows, which is the name for Egypt in Hebrew, as the birth canal. He actually sees the opening of the sea to the left and to the right um, and coming through it as the birth and as the kind of awakening of the human soul as, um, as when, when the soul arrives at Mount Sinai. So the birth comes in creation because we are created as peoples are created, but the revelation comes through the encounter with God. It's a, it's a very complicated question. I answered it in a very few words. But anyways, I'm mostly just showing off and letting you know that I know the answer to the question. Um, uh, I'm giving you your 10-minute warning, just so you can All right, your I can do this in, in 10 minutes. Um, uh, God, uh, the relationship with the God and the world is one of law, and therefore Judaism has an aspect of law in it. But the relationship with humanity, the love is a love relationship. That is the moment of therapy. That is, the, that is what we really need um, to be... Um, to be realized and to get out of the Hegelian, or the, at least the perceived Hegelian um, trap. Um, and, and, and you're going to go into the world and love is going to reveal itself to you. This, this interplay is going to be the way that we bring love and life and consciousness to basically a mute world, right? So the redemption is humanity becoming the mind of the world and living in harmony with the world right, the whole world. And we could do this as Jews because after all, Judaism is older than Christianity. It didn't have an intermediary of Jesus in between us and God. We could, we could encounter God. No, no exile, no exile. Exile is where Judaism grows. Ex Judaism is a timeless religion and it's a religion of eternity. And since religion of eternity exists outside of time, then if you land it in a particular place, then it would lose its Jewish genius. Therefore, Rosenzweig turns out to be, you know, he's, he dies in 1929, before the Great Troubles, before we certainly need Israel, before all those things. He, he's on the anti-Zionist camp because he says Jews can't afford to be a landed religion. Christianity is a religion of time. We are the timeless religion, right? That's why I put in the little blurb here, answer his timeless questions. It was a little bit of a joke. Um, uh, can someone repeat what he said about what? I can't see the whole question. One second. About redemption, humanity in the world, got it. Um, uh, um, if we go through this um, uh, experience, now put up my circle, the circle chart. If we go through this whole experience, Abby, maybe I lost it here. If we go through this whole experience, we will, we, humanity, led, not led by Jews, but Jews playing a, a key role, right? A part of the thing, an indispensable part of human harmony with the earth. We will become the mind of the earth, right? Right now we're the mind of the earth, but we're, but we're not paying attention to the earth. If we become a mind of the earth, then we'll bring the earth and humanity into harmony. That was his understanding. And, with, and to do this, we need, we need to go through a... Uh, a, a process, and I'm now going to do the process in seven more minutes. Cool? All right. No questions. Here it is. He does not see the holidays. Usually when we, under, when we read the holidays, we read the holidays as um, individual events. I can teach you about Shavuot, or I can teach you about Passover, and, and, and that's it. But like everything else, Rosenzweig never sees anything as a particular moment. Right? All moments are connected to each other. Yeah, that's why oh, Miriam Hoffman says correctly, right? The relationship between God and, and, and the world is law. The relationship between God and humanity is love. But the relationship between humanity and the world is hope, right? That's why at the very end of the Star of Redemption, he says, into life. We hope that we're going to, this is the hope. Sukkot, it's a weird holiday because it doesn't take you home. It takes you on the way, on the derech. I always think that um, 
um, in the book of Ruth that we'll read um, uh, soon, um, there are four settings. And the first is setting is Naomi and Ruth on the way home. It's on the derech. That, that's a powerful thing, right? Naomi, the Jewish woman, Ruth, the Moabite woman, almost holding hands, walking on the derech, on the way back to redemption, right? Only, only, and, and then actually redemption, you know, the, the Levite marriage, the Goel, Boaz, is going to be the redeemer. And so the whole story is walking from the revelation of each other, the love that Naomi and Ruth have on the way home to Israel, to Bethlehem, for the moment of redemption. All right, now back to the chart. He's going to connect all the holidays as a single narrative. Don't think of, of, of Passover as the liberation holiday only. Think about it as the love holiday. This is the night of all nights. This is the song of all songs. This is the one holiday in which the kids get to ask the questions. And you have to have a symposium, not just for the smartest kids in your class, but even for the youngest kids, right? It has to be everyone. This is a, this is a ceremony, the Seder, to bring us together as a people and, and as a whole, intergenerational people, right? Then, if you look at the, at the inner track there, or the outer track, it says Omer seven weeks. This is going to be connecting Passover to Shavuot like a wedding. Passover is Birchat Erusin, and Pas Passover is going to be the holiday of betrothal and pure love. That's why we read the Song of Songs, right? Night of all nights, meal of all meals, story of all stories, song of all songs. And we're going to read that and then on the day of the doubles, another double, Malchut Sheba Malchut, Kingdom of Kingdoms, that's a too obscure reference, no time right now, um, you're going to go like a bride around the groom, right? Seven times around, um, seven weeks between Passover and Shavuot, and you'll arrive at, Shavu at Shavuot as the bride and the groom standing and ready to be united as one. You've walked out of the world in these seven circuits, and when you get to the moment Tubishvan is missing, it's true. I Tubishvan's not missing. Where is it? Yeah, maybe it is. Tubishvan was basically uh, uh, April 15th. It was tax day. Um, um, uh, so the guy that made the chart that took it out, maybe I, I, I wrote all the little things on the chart. Um, uh, so, so we're going to get to Mount Sinai, and it's going to be the day of love, right? And the day of love, now I'm actually integrating Tubishvan into the story. Um, uh, the day of love is going to be when God is going to reveal the ketubah, the ketubah being the Torah to us. Don't think of the ketubah as law. Think of the ketubah, think of the Torah as a ketubah between Israel and God. And as you know, the ketubah connects the male, the, the bride and the groom together, and it affects both of them. Rosenzweig's deep insight into this is that God's love for us also affects God, right? God is made out of God's love for us. God's whole experience of us is, is based in that moment of love. Um, there's a famous story in Shabbat 88a called Har Kigigit, where God takes the mountain of Sinai and holds it over our head and says, listen, take the Torah or I'm going to drop the mountain on you and this will be your grave. Rosenzweig sees that story as God taking the mountain and holding it over our head as a chuppah, as a marriage canopy. And we are then taken out of time, right? We've been in time for seven weeks, counting day, 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 one, two, three, all the way to 49. And this day, it's not the 50th day, it's the every day. It's the no time day. It's the time out. It's the time in which we both feel between the mountain above our heads as death and the mountain above our heads as the chupa. So I wrote, uh, at, if you look at the bottom of the chart at around six o'clock, you'll see love is as, and then above Yom Kippur, it says, uh, after where it says 40 days, a, a little arrow, strong as death, right? So the whole year is going to be between Passover and Yom Kippur. What happens? Moses goes up the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights on, on, on Shavuot. He comes down on Shavas Rebbe Tammuz, on the 17th of Tammuz. We, are built, we already built the golden calf. I put a little golden calf there for you. Um, uh, um, uh, then um, uh, great disappointment, infidelity, our marriage is off yelling, sleeping on the couch, therapy. That's what Rosa Spike says, but you have to feel all this stuff as it's happening to you. Then on the beginning, on the first of the month of Elul, you see at the top, it's like 11 o'clock at the top. The month of Elul is the beginning of the month of love, right? Elul is an acronym for Anila Dodi Vidodi Li, I, my beloved, my beloved is mine, which is from Song of Songs. Only at the end of that, the beginning of Tishrei, 
is on, on, on Rosh Hashanah, you're finally hearing the blast of the shofars that are blown now, right? When you get to the morning, Rosenzweig says you're supposed to experience the actual shofar that is blowing on Mount Sinai, but we can't hear it because we're too overwhelmed by the love of the moment of Mount Sinai. So we have to wait till this whole um, next um, uh, period of time before we get to Rosh Hashanah. Only then can we hear the shofar because we're now going to experience the other side of passion, which will be death. Death will be the, we'll act out death on Yom Kippur. We won't eat, we won't drink, we don't wear shoes, we don't um, wash ourselves, we don't, we simulate our death. And at the end of that moment of death, we get, go into the second attempt at marriage. So Sukkot, with us carrying around the lulav and etrog, these kind of, uh, you know, erotic uh, pieces of, uh, of uh, shrubbery, um, and a lot of thrusting in all directions, this is going to be the wedding where we walk around seven times, just like the bride around the groom, just like the Omer between Passover and Shavuot, we're now going to get married to God again. And the person that holds the Torah on, on, on Simchat Torah is going to be called the Chatan Torah. it will be the bridegroom of the Torah because the ultimate moment of the wedding is now finished. Rosenzweig says this calendar will be therapy for us. We have the past in Passover. We have the future in Sukkot. But we only get one moment of the actual presence, and that is now. And you don't want to miss a moment of the presence because there are no moments in the present. And therefore, what do you do in Shavuot? You stay up all night. You stay up all night because you couldn't, you can't sleep because there is no night, there is no day. It's all one moment. And Glatzer, all those years ago, I remember his face, I remember his eyes, I remember his voice. And he looked at us and he says, I welcome you to this moment of the present. Wake up. Wake up. I remember that's the last thing. And then he, he, he walked off. He said, wake up. I'm, I'm 18 years old. And I said to myself, oh, my God, this is it. I, I, I want to wake up. And I want to wake up. And I want to wake up with you. He said, wake up. Even in the middle of the night, wake up. At the end of the middle of the night, wake up. In life, wake up. Don't live a, a, a mundane life. Live a, a life of being awake, of feeling, and of experiencing, and of surrounding yourself. And that, that is the moment of Glasser. And I have to say, because it's a moment of the present, and there's only one moment of the present, even though I'm now 67 years old, I can get back to being an 18-year-old in a flash, standing right before Glatzer at Brandeis University, all the way to here in my house in Budapest, looking at all of you. So I want to say to you, a good jantif and a good moment of love and revelation. <laughs> <laughs>